Awesome. And welcome to the latest podcast of Winter Garden Yoga. My name is Brian. I'm the owner and the director of Winter Garden Yoga. And I'm super happy to have Mr. Dan John speaking with us this afternoon. Dan, will you please introduce yourself and tell folks a little bit about yourself? Well, yeah, I'm Dan John. Um, I'm 61. I've been lifting weights since 1965. I've been coaching since 1979. Um, I, I, I write books and they do well about strength and conditioning. And, uh, you know, I like to say life. In this, I believe that the same thing you learn in the weight room is the same lessons you learn in finance and, and basically life. Uh, paid for all my education thrown the discus. Uh, I have a bunch of master's degrees. I was a Fulbright scholar, travel the world a lot, and I love what I do. Awesome. And you're an author of a few books. Will you throw out some of your book titles, please? Yeah, sure. Um, well, there's a, there's a three-part series that I think is the best. I, of course, no, they don't buy. That stuff. <laughs> uh, that's Intervention, Can You Go, and Now What? And then the book that changed my life called Never Let Go. That, it was a vanity press, you know, 432 copies. But it sold seventeen thousand the first weekend, which nice. has changed. And then a, a follow up to that called "Before We Go." Uh, there's a book called "Easy Strength" and another book called "Hard Style Kettlebell uh, Challenge." Those two books are more um, kind of do this books. My ultimate do this book is called "Mass Made Simple." About it's a six week program to put on body weight, and, and it's really hard. And if you do it, you get good results. And then I have a book on discus throwing called "The Contrarian Approach to Discus," and that's free on my website. Uh, a book I wrote to my daughter, and so many people asked me to, that we put it. It's called From Dad to Grad, and uh, it's free on my website. Uh, so many people asked for it. We just made it into a PDF. And then I have another book on my website for free called uh, From the Ground Up. Um, uh, <laughs> oh, and then I have, you know, 40 Years with a Whistle coming out. But I want to say there's others, but I didn't think yeah. And what's the website where people can check that out? Well, you can go to my website, danjohn.net, or if you could put the link for OTP books. Okay. Wouldn't mind that, okay? We'll I think that. It's, oh, it's on target publications, otp.com. I, mm -hmm. You wouldn't mind. I, yeah, it's fine. I, I don't ever, yeah, I don't ever send people. I'll be happy to. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. And also, you've got DVDs, lectures seminars, yeah. all the stuff that uh, people can check out there. There are almost, is it safe to say that they are video versions of some of your books? Uh, yeah. What we, one of the things that I, and I recommend this to other people trying to write a fitness book, do a DVD. Uh, do a DVD, have people ask questions, and that will backfill the problem areas of what you're trying to say. Gotcha. Um, that would be true for that would be true for three of them, but there's other ones too. With I did I did one with Chip Conrad, but uh, I, uh, with intervention, I thought I had a book, but I told Laurie I got to test this. I got to test this, mm -hmm. and she said, "Do you mind if I film it?" And I thought, "Okay, win win," you know. And then we did that with Can You Go? Okay, win win. And then we did that with Now What? So yeah, yeah. Um, Excellent. It's it's an odd thing for the people out there who've never written. There's this idea that you sit down with your pipe and you <laughs> pull out a piece of paper and you write, uh, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, or in the beginning. And it's nothing like that. It's, it's especially in our world of fitness, because the, what might be completely obvious to me is lost on my readership sometimes. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very, you, I wouldn't say you have to define a lot, but you have to make sure you have some layers of explanation. And that only comes out sometimes in dialogue. Uh, one of the things I try to teach my athletes, it comes from acting, but there's monologue, there's dialogue, and there's soliloquy. And so when I ask you, what's your name? You know, you do a monologue. You know, I'm Brian, I'm Winter Garden Yoga guy. You know, I have two cats, and that's a monologue. <laughs> and a dialogue is when we start to go across. Mm -hmm. But what you want to get to as a coach is you want your athletes to have a soliloquy. When they talk, they actually listen to themselves. Mm -hmm. So why, you know, I would say to you, why didn't you do well? And you'll go, well, I'll tell you what happened. Three days before, you know, and then, and then hopefully while you're going through this brilliant explanation of the problem, you're actually listening to yourself. Right. And what happened in the future. So, but when you coach, you start to codify everything. Like 
uh, if you're one of my athletes, uh, I was in a system that we had a play called Right 23. That was it. Right 23. And I can tell you what 11 people are going to do from Right 23. Well, I can tell this to your audience. Right 20. Here's another one. Uh, West Special. Okay. Relax Middle Stretch. Every one of those is completely, I, my brain just went, <laughs> and, all those blanks, and the whole audience is sitting there going, I have no idea. What but, right. but in your field too, okay? You know, I'll, I'll be doing a workshop sometime and I'll just be showing them an exercise we use and I'll hear someone say, cat, cow. And I'm like, what are you looking out the window or something? What did you get away? Hey. <laughs> but, in, you know, uh, Savasana has a, a very specific meaning in yoga. But if I said Savasana to somebody who didn't know yoga, they'd be like, what are you? Right. But once you get into a group, you're, you're with me, right? Mm-hmm. You have a lot of code words in my world in weightlifting. Mm-hmm. And, and it's, I don't think they're bad because you, you, you can't always say, like, if you ever read German translations, they're hilarious. The two handed grip wide, you know, <laughs> from forward to above head in single motion. Right. We just call that the snatch. Okay? Right. Yeah, so, so that's why the, the, the process of going making a DVD uncodes me. Someone will raise their hand and say, I, you lost me at, you know, West Special Relax Middle Stretch. Right. That's oh. a hip hinge or whatever, whatever it's, <laughs> right? It, it, can be, it can be something as simple as squat versus hip hinge. Right, right. And that's why you'll notice, I think, I hate to brag, but I think my best work is when somebody asks me a question that is, and this sounds awful, but it's completely obvious to me. Mm-hmm. But then my my dad, my inner father, my inner coach, my inner teacher goes, yeah, it's obvious to me, but mm-hmm. there is the gap there I have to deal with. There's right. Let me fill right. that. And I had, um, I had a similar experience in, in the yoga realm. One of, one of my best teachers was not even a yoga teacher. She was a yoga student. And um, she was just, you know, helping me through practice. Uh, it's just like anything else. They, you kind of get spot checked. As you're practicing, someone will tell you, put your foot here, put your hand here, etc." But that's what she did. She just said, put your foot here. Put your hand here. She didn't say the spiraling energy from your shashumna comes through your shakti and then radiates out through. Because no. some teachers will do that. It's like, what, what do you, you want me to raise my arm? Just say, and, raise your arm, <laughs> right? You're, you're Googling all these Hindu terms. Yeah. <laughs> do you mean outer rotating spiral or inner rotating? That's right. And is I, it I, the I, pingala? I, or? <laughs> as a, you know, as a throws coach, you know, it's, once I pick up my right foot, it takes 1.6 seconds to deliver the implement. That's fast. And so when you're coaching the throws, you're, you, we have a phrase, you can't think through a ballistic movement. Mm-hmm. but we have to get you in the right place. So I might work with an athlete. I hate to, this sounds awful, but three years, lots of time and energy. And someone will just take a, a, another kid will go, Oh no, just, you know, kind of, and I'm not, I don't even want to use my hand. That's why, you know, mm-hmm. kind of, you know, blah, blah. and Oh, is that what he's trying to say? Right. I mean, like, yeah, that's yeah. That's Look over your shoulder. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's, and that's, and it's funny, I have a workshop called The Art of Coaching. And to me, the art of coaching is when you take a complex concept and you deliver it simply. Because mm-hmm. to be honest with you, uh, uh, calculus is complex. And if, if it takes a while to learn calculus, well, your answer should be to me, well, of course it does. Right. Uh, certain things in life are simple, like boiling water. So if I... We put, when I'm showing my grandson how to boil water. We, we take a pot, we put water in and we turn the flame on. I go, you do that. Got it. Simple concept, simple <laughs> instruction. <laughs> Can I swear? Can I use oh, a pot please, please. Okay, then there's the third kind where you take a very simple comp- uh, concept and you complicate the hell out of it. Yeah. And I call that bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to the fitness industry in a nutshell. I'm going to give you four words. Yeah. Get ready? Yes. Health. Health. Okay, now health. There you go. I use Maffetone's d- definition. 
It's the optimal interplay of the human organs. If your pancreas is pancreating, if your liver is livering, your lungs are lunging, uh, health, you, you improve your health by seeing your medical doctor, by going to the dentist, I argue three times a year, but you know most people only get paid for two, mm-hmm. and seeing your eye doctor every year. You, you determine your health by a blood test, okay? If your blood test numbers are in a certain range, you don't have a debilitating disease, then I put you in the, I, I consider you healthy. Now, there might be other complications. I have dealt with people who've been missing limbs mm-hmm. from war and stuff like that, but they're healthy. The next word is the one that everybody gets in trouble with. It's fitness. I use Darwin's definition. Can you do a task? Mm-hmm. So at my prime, I weighed 273 pounds. I could barely climb up a flight of stairs, but boy, could I throw the discus far. I was fit to throw a discus far. If when the, my knock on CrossFitters, my knock on a lot of people, is they use a definition of a, of a, of a task to define fitness. You know, you can run a marathon, and there's pictures of marathoners uh, with still running with diarrhea attacks. Mm-hmm. Well, okay, if they've crossed the finish line, they're fit. You could win a marathon with probably with cancer inside your body. You're fit mm-hmm. for the task of running a marathon, but you're not healthy. Right. When people marry those two concepts is where you get in trouble. Let me add a third word. I'm going to add two more, actually. Mm-hmm. The next one is longevity. And with longevity, there's two issues. There's the quantity, you know, um, you're going to live to be 196. And there's the quality. You're going to live to 196 in a coma from age two. But they're just going to keep that shell alive. Quantity and quality have to come in. Mm -hmm. In my family, we don't have quantity. We either get killed uh, in the military or we die of cancer. I've known this since I was a child. Mm -hmm. So for me, I focus on my quality of life. Now, ideally, by focusing on the health issues, I will feed forward the quantity of my life later. And the fourth word is the one we all get in trouble. It's performance. I spend a lot of time, Brian, with uh, Broadway actors and actresses, musicians, um, uh, 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 singers, athletes. When they call your name, you step in the lights and you perform. Mm -hmm. So here's the problem you're going to have. And you're going to see this online now. Hi, I'm Bob Jones, performance coach. Performance is when they call your name and you step in. Spokane, Washington, it's a Saturday in July, 9 a.m. They say, John, you're up. I stepped into the ring and I threw the discus. Nobody asked me for blood tests. Nobody said I was too fat, too ugly, too skinny to be a discus thrower. And no one cared about any of those other factors. Performers perform. Jumpers jump, throwers throw, dancers dance, swimmers swim. What happens in our little world is people like to take those, drop them in a blender, go, woo! <laughs> right. They say they're all the same thing. And when you do that, you run into trouble. Because you look at this 22-year-old guy who's got six-pack abs, and you think he's an expert on longevity. Or you look at this other per- and you start to make these decisions because someone is abil- a- able to do a task. Like you guys in yoga, have, you're able to do these certain tasks, tasks along the line of flexibility and mobility that, frankly, I find amazing. But that doesn't mean you're going to be a good NFL footballer. Correct. If you're too flexible, you can get, well, I mean, you need to be, obviously. Yeah. Strength and flexibilities are swim in a yin-yang relationship, okay? Right. Correct. You need both. But the problem is, just by saying what I just said right there, I separated myself with most people in the world of fitness. Because I said something that was actually interesting. In it. <laughs> but if you follow my point, Mm-hmm. Everyone's always trying to take the the square peg and pound in the round holes. So if you did, I hope you don't mind, Brian, but I really need to make sure people understand that. Mm-hmm. Because what happens is there are some things. You, oh, here, and I'm going to add one more thing in a second. Don't say, Dan, add, <laughs> add one more thing. Yeah, add, please. So really, let me just summarize. For longevity, 
basically health, basically fitness, you probably need to exercise 100 minutes a week. Okay? That we know that that number seems right. At some level, you need to fast in your life. That means you, and now, fasting and starvation are not the same thing. Hunger, hunger, starvation, fasting, you can throw in a bunch of full. We know that at some level, intermittent fasting, I, I said intermittent, which is a new thing, but mm-hmm. every religious tradition has fasting. But we also know that people's blood profiles improve after they fast. If you're constantly grazing, you're your body needs a break, okay? So 100 ec- minutes exercise a week, some kind of fasting. You have to have some level of good dental hygiene. We, we think vegetables help with health. We think, and now, now the argument is, it's because vegetables are trying not to be eaten, and all those things that they're throwing at your body, are it, that makes your body stronger. Okay, so okay, I don't know what was going to do Right. The recent research says that coffee and red wine probably help with longevity, which is, you know, I'm doing my best to knock that out of my wall. But honestly, it, 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 and then of course, wear your seatbelt and don't smoke and don't, and I always tell people this, don't try to be stupid. And that try is very important. People can do stupid things, but don't go out of your way. You know, the old hold my beer, I'm gonna go right. wrestle the alligator. <laughs> so really, it's much simpler. Now, you were supposed to remind me of one. I was? Yeah, okay. I'll tell you what it is. Tell me. Right there, I say health, fitness, longevity, performance. A hand always goes up. What about fat loss? Oh, okay. What about fat loss? Oh, because that's the bugaboo. You go online, you talk to people. I don't know what it's like in your world, but every party I go to, because of what I do, People want to talk about fat loss. And I keep saying, well, what are, your blood, what are your blood profiles? When's the last time you went to a dentist? Do you go see an eye doctor? Because I'm trying to get them to think about their health first. Right, right. Do you, you, do you walk, uh, do you exercise 100 minutes a week, which is not much. It isn't. When's the last time you read a good book? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm serious. I'm, I understand. And, but what they want is they want a pill, a lozenge, you know, you know, something like that. They can pop in their mouth. And the fat will magically burn away. And it's like, you know, Art Devaney got attacked for the following statement. But this woman said to him, what's the best thing to do to lose fat? And he said, don't get fat in the first place. Right. Well, he's right. <laughs> you, know, you want to sit down with your, your kids when they're in their teenage years. And when they go off to college or that, you know, that transition time, 18 to about, 18, about 25 or so, right? Mm-hmm. And just say, listen. Those, that pizza and beer, you own those decisions the rest of your life. And if you can kind of get through that seven year, isn't it funny? I now think the awkward stage for humans is about late teen to mid twenties because that's where most, I mean, I, I bump into former students sometimes. Mr. John, do you recognize me? I recognize about a 30. <laughs> so this reminds me, well, let's take two steps back if we can. So the whole idea of health and fitness, what what Dan was just talking about a minute or so ago, is that health and fitness is not one long word. It's two separate words that should be compartmentalized, health and fitness. And to your point, and there have even been stories, I can't remember the fellow's name, He he was a big uh, leader in the in the jogging realm when when jogging was well, well, right. uh, Jim Fix Fix is yeah, that he right? died running he yeah, died he, he dropped dead jogging so Grace Kelly's brother the Olympic rower died rowing died rowing so that's not an argument that's not an argument for people to, to not. not exercise right it's unfortunately those fellas may not have been healthy although they were fit. And, and that's why I always throw in longevity. As part, it, when I talk about health, I try to slide people into the longevity discussion. Because what I'm trying to get you to think is, if you decide, okay, you, you join a CrossFit gym, and this is the reason I bring this up is a young lady I worked with just a few weeks ago. I was on a road trip to the East, and we had, we had lunch together. 
She's 28 and she's had massive shoulder injuries, surgeries from doing this exercise they teach called a kipping pull-up. Mm. Now she's trying to get back into shape. And I said to her, well, you know, those kipping pull-ups you did, you wrote a check that you'll still be paying on if you make it to 90. When you're 90 and you go to reach up to get, you know, a loaf of bread, that shoulder is still going to be broken. Mm -hmm. So I always keep trying to shut her. And then, honestly, now listen, I'm a performance athlete. I pay for all my education. I travel the world as an athlete. But there's not a joint on my body. Hold on. That's not true, Brian. I lied to you. My ankles have never had a surgery. So if I die right now, grab those ankles. <laughs> okay. Never been cut. But every other major joint in my body has had surgery. But I'm fine with that because my book, Never Let Go, my, both, my, both my daughters graduated from college debt-free because of my athletic career. My athletic career. Right. And so uh, it's the old thing you do back in the day, at least when I was young, is that uh, you put your child in a situation where you, they could be successful. Mm -hmm. Ideally, my daughter just left for it. Ideally, she'll set her grandkids up. Her set her kids and grandkids up, and ideally, will you know, will be a, a, an American story. That was the tradition. Now, of course, you just write a check and get your kids in, <laughs> <laughs> which is a separate <laughs> podcast, valid but separate. So, uh, part of one of the questions that I've written down is, where does the and I don't, I don't, this is more rhetorical than anything. It's more of a discussion point, but where does the confusion come in that the average person, I'm average person, where is it that they get the idea that they have to do CrossFit to be fit or that they have to do high intensity interval training and intermittent fast and take this supplement just as as general physical preparedness, does that make sense? It is true. There are a number of us in the field who push hard against that. Mm -hmm. But it's very difficult when you go to Instagram, when you go to Facebook, when you go to this, any, you type in fat loss and just wait to what you see. Mm -hmm. Honest to God, you will probably see more things that will bother you if you type in fat loss into your Google search than if you typed in porn. I'm just uh, by the at least in porn sites, you know what you're getting, and you, <laughs> you know, but fat loss, you just don't know. Um, what I would argue is that we have we are now, if you don't mind, when we go back to the great tradition of Western civilization, we didn't have the Cartesian model, we were body, soul, spirit mind mm -hmm. we were all linked in together and it's funny you teach yoga now one of the definitions of yoga is uh to some people say yoke mm -hmm. but i think the better translation is is to be is binding and that why i like that one is because the definition of religion religi religios same root as ligament is to bind back to connect mm -hmm. to knit the original word for fit is Old Nordic, and it means to knit. So to me, a fit person is a well-knitted person. So I tell people this all the time. You know, if you've got six-pack abs and your kids hate your guts, in my world, you're not fit. You know, if you can do uh, some magical yoga thing, but you're also, <laughs> you know, sex, whatever, you're not knitted. And so what has happened is, is here in the West, we have taken that great tradition and we've unlinked it. You know, um, you know, temperance, you know, the great concept of temperance. Originally, you know, one of the ways you explain it is that your brain is, this, is the charioteer holding those horses back. You know, your, your body is a bunch of horses. Mm -hmm. Even back in, the, back in the, the old writings, you'll see that they even argued that's a terrible way to explain it. So luckily for me, and I'm just, if you don't mind, uh, I always like to get to the solution. Mm -hmm. In the second grade, and the joke, of course, the three best years of my life, uh, Sister Maria Sumta went up to the board, and she wrote this little compass. Work, rest, play, and pray. And she said, if you want to be successful in life, 
you can't let work go too far, mm -hmm. but you can't let rest go too far. And you and she was a nun, so she didn't mention prayer too far. Right. <laughs> if you play all the time, you're not going to go too far. You always needed to keep that compass in balance. Mm -hmm. So for for those of you who might be agnostic or atheist, that would be alone time or appreciation of nature. Heck, read a book. You know, read a book. Turn off your social media and read a book. Uh, they, 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 oh, okay. For some of your listeners, a book is a, a collection of papers <laughs> that are bound together, and you flip through them, you you get a story. Sometimes or learn information. <laughs> some of the people just got scared and hung up. <laughs> but you know what helped me there is that through my whole life. Now, let me just—I'm going to add one little thing. Mm -hmm. In my life, when I decided to, I had for a couple times in my life, I've had to add more work. Well, what I did is I looked and I thought back to Sister Marie and I said, okay, if I'm going to work harder, I'm literally going to have to rest harder. Right there is, right next to me right there is a sauna. Right behind me there, I can see it. Uh, but that's a Megan electronic massage bed. I have a hot tub on my porch and I have a, an ice shower out there too. And the more I work, the more travel I do, the more I insist that I rest harder. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if you've been around me, but people will tell you I play hard, but I also read a lot of books and I also mm -hmm. spend a lot of quality time alone because if I work harder, I must plan in more rest, more alone time, prayer time, and more play time. And it's funny because as I try to, as I've spiraled my life out, trying to get bigger and bigger and bigger, when I make mistakes, is when I shrink one of those other three things. So I, okay, here's the problem, listener, is he asked a very good, valid question, and I went off this long philosophical. <laughs> it's great. But the reason I did that is, is because I sometimes feel, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to get hit by a bus one day, and I just feel like a whole, like one of the last voices of what we consider Western civilization is going to die. Because I, I just, these things that are just so much a part of me, this non cartesian this is your body, this is your brain, mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're there now. And, and, you know, some of the stuff I hear people do, it's like working out until you vomit. Okay, why, how does that, why is that? <laughs> because obviously your stomach is trying to tell, the, the, the stomach is sending signals up like, okay, whatever's going on is obviously terrible. Right. So we're going to start losing every resource we have to just, you know, we got to survive this. And that's just not a good way to go through life. Uh, one of the things you'll notice, you know, I don't know how much time you spend, but when you look at the lives of some of these people, you don't want to live their lives. I mean, do you want to, I mean, the old joke, but do you want to leave, you know, live in a van down by the river? <laughs> because honestly, that's what some of them do. Right. The divorce rate in the field is sky is through the roof. And, and I get divorce. I certainly understand divorce. I certainly understand people change. I get it all. And, and I understand that you can make, you can make dumb decisions. You can make bad choices. I understand all of it. But when you see it over and over and over again, you have to sit back and go, your model, your, yeah, your model, your, your, your vision of these things is flawed, right? At the beginning, you're not knitted. You're not linked. You're not, you're not tied in. And when, so one of the things that I think even just listening to, I feel like we're on the same path here. What, you know, I like it when you go to a place, a yoga place, and they have a canned food drive. Do, do you have, do you give us, are, you, are we going to video this? We are videoing it right now. Uh, you know, okay. Can I, can I just show you something real interesting? Please. Yeah. Do you mind? Okay. I'm going to tell you something that, I mean, I hope you don't think I'm full of crap because I don't. Uh, there's, there's the Megan bed. Oh, and there's Sirius Black. Say hi, Sirius. He's bored with you. Um, this is my sauna. Okay, got that? Yeah. yeah. But I want to show you something because it, it ties in exactly. Okay, do you see all this stuff right here? Maybe you can't see it very well. You see all the backpacks over there? Yes. Okay, so my weightlifting friends and I. Uh, last weekend, those are socks. This is, we're taking this all down to the y, YWCA, 
these, every one of these backpacks is filled with all kinds of needs that women need. Uh, we also are doing a fundraiser where we raised a whole bunch of money to buy clothes. My weightlifting friends, right? personal friends. Yes. We had a big party where we filled all these bags and blankets and they're full of women's products and snacks and everything you could possibly use. <laughs> Shavers and shampoos and every kind of care you can think of. But to me, to me, I'm as proud of that. And we'll take, but by the way, take it on tomorrow. We had to, we had to make that. There's so much stuff. We had to have a, a, an appointment, but to me, to me, that's, that's what being fit is. That's mm-hmm. my definition of fit. My weightlifting friends came over here. We, we ate uh, shepherd's pie and we loaded and everybody donated. Uh, one young lady donated. She bought gloves for every person but she bought the gloves at Home Depot, those real good Mm -hmm. work gloves, you know? They're not only warm, but you can do stuff with them. You know I mean? It just kind of, it kind of inspires you. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying you have to do things this way, but but I like the way we do it. Understood. So that, that's incredible. So it's a matter of taking care of yourself enough that you can start to take care of others as well. Is that, a piece of it yeah I yeah. made it so when I was in high school my dad had all kinds of personal issues the place he worked at closed I had three brothers go to Vietnam two are disabled and I sat there one day in my chair and I said either the military or throw the discus far but I know this my kids aren't gonna have to make that decision right okay and ideally my grandkids want to make that decision so I've always been that you know when you try to do things, what? Okay, I'm 61. Mm-hmm. You know what? If you had to move a couch, I'm your first phone call. <laughs> yeah. Why do you call the 61-year-old? Because A, you'll know I'll show up, and B, I lift weights five days a week and I'm strong. Right. And that's, that's who I want to be when I grow up. Still are. Yeah. Awesome. So this could be a, a good segue into, now that, now that you're 61, what – and I know you talk about this great length in one of your videos. You'll have to forgive me. I'm not sure if it's intervention, but you talk about different focuses for different age ranges, right? Like when you're 20 yeah. something, do sure. whatever the heck you want. When you're 30, the scope kind of narrows. Sure. You want, so, okay, uh, let's use the ones from fit ranks. Cause it's just, there's good clarity there. Okay. Okay. okay so fit ranks, uh, uh, Nick Rains, company. He, I like he breaks this up into three divisions, okay? I like that. So this is real simple. 16 to 35, 36 to 55, and then hello, 56 and above. <laughs> but when you're basically 16 to 35, you know, you know I feel like I'm going to start singing, in the autumn of the year. Have you ever heard Orson Welles? I know what it's like to be young, but you don't know what it's like to be old. No, but I love it. Ideally, by the time you turn 16, you've had a good physical education coach. You know the rules of all the games and sports. You basically have a low level understanding of it. Like you can dribble with your hands and your feet. You should be able to be somewhat ambidextrous. Uh, I still have this funny thing. I tell my people all the time, can you do a cartwheel both directions? And the women will go, yeah, I I can't go the other way. Right. Most, most women are Abby cartwheelers. They can only go one way, you know, so it's funny to watch them go the other way. Uh, can you catch a ball with both hands? Can you kick a ball with both hands? I mean, that's that kind of simple stuff. Can you swim? You know, it's like the old, the old, there's an old uh, uh, Hindu parable about, uh, can I tell it to you real quick? Cause it's one of my favorites. Sure. Of course, please. This young man goes off to, uh, to, uh, you know, to study as a scholar of, of religion. And as he's going home, he has to cross a boat. And as the boatman's pulling across like this. So what did you learn in school? Oh, important things, theology, religion, you know, yoga, you know. Oh, good. They teach you to swim? No, that's not important. Well, the boat's sinking. <laughs> right. <laughs> so you, it's good to learn to swim and ride a bicycle when you're young and uh, resilient. But by the time you get to about 16, that's if you want to lift weights, if you want to explore – that's the time you, you really have to run with it. Uh, you know, ultimate Frisbee is a wonderful sport. 
uh, from 16 to 35. I played flag football into my late, late forties. Yeah. I no, flag, I, yeah, flag football into my late forties. You run around, you explode, you dance. You have the whole buffet of athletics and sports from 16 to 35. You know, if you don't know how to power lift, you should learn, you should learn the basics of power lifting, Olympic lifting, kettlebells, calisthenics, a little bit of gymnastics, sports and games. But after about 35, 36, in your life, and you'll pick it up, people say, I seem to have lost a step. And I always say, well, you didn't have a step in the first place, but okay, you lost it. Um, from about 36 on to about 55, it's time to start grinding more in the weight room in life. <clears throat> um, this is the time where you really want to make sure your strength and your flexibility so strength and flexibility are neurological tricks. So from 36 to about 55, strength, and we know this from the research, uh, grip strength, uh, standing up strength, you know, it's called the toilet bowl test. If you can squat to the toilet, you can still, you, know, you don't have to be in home. Um, you build up those qualities at that time. After 56, there's two qualities, hypertrophy, maintaining keeping and maybe even increasing lean body mass and then joint mobility the ability to move freely around every joint um now at my age i still compete but what people ask me what my secret is is i've kind of lucked into this thing now if you don't mind let me explain it in a different way mm -hmm. most guys when they go to the weight room they body build first and then they realize they're not going to be the next mr universe then they try powerlifting, and then with this big engine, they try the Olympic lift. The right way to go through life is ballistic stuff, Olympic lift, kettle, fast kettlebells, then the power lifts, and then you bodybuild. Most people have it completely opposite. Yeah, upside down. So once you get to 50, your 50s, you should train like a bodybuilder. And if you go online, sometimes you'll find a 70 year old woman who bodybuilds or that one guy who was 96 and stuff. Mm -hmm. Charles Eugister, I think his name was, who was in a bodybuilding contest and a sprinter at 96, 97, and just a, just a beacon of life. Uh, you, you get it right if you do it that way. And, but that's, it's a hard lesson. Now for your yoga stuff, um, you know, you have different families of yoga, right? Mm-hmm. And that might be something to talk to your people about. You know, um, I know people still come in and they want fat loss in yoga. I mean, there's that, that one style that the, the predator uses, a uh, 90 minute uh, guy. I won't mention the name of the yoga, but it's about 90. Oh. <laughs> Is it um, 26? 26 exercises. Posters done twice for 90 minutes in a hundred degree yeah. Fahrenheit room. That he invented after learning it from the lady down the street, as we yeah. discovered later. Um, but you know, there's, a, you know, I'm I'm sure that there is a style of yoga that's very appropriate when you're young. In fact, probably when you're young, you probably should probably try every variation you can find. But once you hit that next range, that's when you want to focus on probably more of the uh, the long, strong movements. Mm -hmm. You know. And then when you get to about my age, there's this one that I did in California one time, an hour and 15 minutes, five poses only. It has a name. I don't know. What Interesting. It is. But like one of the poses was you put your feet up on the wall mm -hmm. 15 minutes. Oh, was this a yin yoga class by any chance? Yin yoga. Yin? Yeah. And then we did child, no, ch uh, frog pose, whatever you call frog mm -hmm. pose. Frog pose. <laughs> frog. Okay. frog pose. Say one thing, you sit in child's position for 15 minutes, you discover things about mm -hmm. your ankle, toes, you discover things about your, 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 your spine, your shoulders. But to me, I thought to myself as I was in the middle of this thing, God, I'd like it if they would package this better. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what we bump into. So to, to address a couple of things, there are definitely different types of yoga. And I know that it, I'm speaking to the choir. It's, om it's almost like you have a soft style and you have a hard style. Yeah. It's kind of like what it goes. There's like those two umbrellas. So yin yes. might be more of like a soft style and restorative might be more of a soft style. 
And then under hard style, you, you have little compartments because you have more of a calisthenic style. They yes. call it vinyasa or flow. Vinyasa, you try, and if that's where you try to do all the hard plank holds. Eh, yeah, you, you, and, I, and I think so. And I think that also what kind of happens here is we get like a little bit confused because of what you were speaking about earlier as yoga being a time to knit, right? So recently I, I saw a, a yoga post. It said something about like therapeutic yoga. I thought to myself, well, that's sort of um, redundant because yoga, in my mind, is supposed to be therapeutic. You're supposed to go to yoga. Weightlifting right? for strength. Well, exactly. It's, you, it's you, like, it, well, didn't you know that they... <laughs> but that's, that's, that's the mix-up in, in the yoga realm, is people get calisthenics in a hot room mixed up with yoga. So like yoga, the way we teach it is more strength and mobility based. So you are, you're knitting, you're pulling yourself together. You're, you're pulling the shoulder down when you reach up. You're doing a hip hinge instead of flexing the spine for a toe touch, etc. It's based on fundamental movement patterns. So that happens in the realm of yoga. Uh, it's just this big word. But there's so many little compartments for it, if that makes sense. And that's, I think, anytime you deep dive into any subject, and there's a name for it. It's called the crooning Duger effect or the Dooning Kruger effect, that you're, you're an expert when you first start doing something, and then you realize that you know nothing. <laughs> you know yeah. The more you learn, the less you know, kind of and, thing. You know, of course, you know, Socrates famously made the circle, you know, where. Uh, when you first learn something, okay, here's the circle. Uh, what you touch on is everything. Uh, okay, this is what I know, and what I don't know is out here. So when I first start, my circle where I touch those things that I know I don't know is here. As I learn more and more and more in my right. field, my circle of what I know I don't know gets bigger and bigger. Even though I'm a cocky bastard, I am actually very humble when it comes to my field. Because the more I'm in it, the more I'm like, I mean, I, and my, my problem is I'll go on to my Q&A thing and somebody will ask me a question about advanced heart rate studies. And I'm like, I don't know. Anyone. I'm, a, I'm, I'm a strength coach. And I'm sure you must feel that way when someone says, I have liver cancer. Will you show me a pose that will help? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's along those lines. Your archer pose, right? That's yeah. yeah. It's sometimes, and I'm sure this happens to you too, is, um, you know, well, for me, for example, someone will say, my shoulder hurts, what's a good stretch? And I say, and I, I'll try to be as nice as possible, and I'll explain, you know, the, the right question is at, to ask is, what's going on with my shoulder? Can you help? Because we don't know that a stretch Stretch could be the total wrong thing to do, but there's just this sort of, I don't know what the word is, collective consciousness that stretching will help stuff that is stiff and yoga people stretch everything. So go to the yoga person for a stretch that will help your stiff knee. You know how I help my left shoulder? This is a weird one. I heard <laughs> getting, ready, get, getting ready for an Olympic lifting contest about two years ago. And it bugged me and bugged me and bugged me. You know how I fixed it? I had a total hip replacement in my right leg. Yeah. That's wait. a whole other thing. <laughs> People got to wait. Oh, by the way, folks, uh, it wasn't weightlifting that caused my hip problems. I was born with something called pistol grip hips. I didn't have a, a ball. I had these, the, instead of a mm. ball, I had these, like a pistol inside yeah. there. It's a congenital thing. My doctor said the day I was born, I was going to start. He goes, when did you start hearing clicks in your hips? I was like, well, They've always clicked. I'm not supposed to. I don't know. Unless someone had told me that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, having a total hip replacement made my right sh uh, left shoulder rule the X. Correct. Fine. Yeah. And so I'll tell people that, and they're like, well, how'd that happen? I'm like, well, and then of course, I, <laughs> let's pull down Tom Myers' Anatomy Trains. Yeah. Let's, or, you know, or any book ever written in the field of, of, of anything, and the answer's me right there. Yeah. 
One of my yoga teachers long, long, long time ago, a guy named David Williams, he said, if you ever want to throw your neck out, just stub your toe. And that, w- that was almost 20 years ago. Yeah. And, I, and I provided, it, it gave me a lot of lip service, like I could repeat that, but I didn't really start to deeply understand it until I got into more, uh, you know, self-massage type things. Tom Meyer's books, um, Kelly Starrett's work. I don't know if you're familiar with Jill Miller, but all these folks who are, yeah. So Jill Miller, the role model, she's got a great book on self-massage and you loosen up your shoulder and your, your hip feels better. You loosen up your low back and your neck feels better. I think I have it. I have it in my other library. Do you? (laughs) I have like 300,000 books or whatever. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, you're right. And, and, you know, we were told at the Olympic Training Center a line that I thought was brilliant. If your brain was so simple, you could understand it, you'd be so simple, you wouldn't care. Right. And we were, we were just talking about how we can, we were, we were, they were giving us this trick. It, it is a trick. It's a funny little thing where you take your performances in your career and um, your failures, and then you literally change your failures into successes. So when you step in the discus ring, it, you, you, your last throw of last season went out of bounds and it cost you making the Olympic team. Well, we can rewind the mind and tell them that it went in and you were on the team. Now, I know that sounds hooey, but it's true. Mm-hmm. You can change the way you think about things. And someone raised their hand and says, how is that possible? How can you change? We don't know, but it works. I was like, oh, that, that funny. It was good enough. <laughs> yeah, write it down. It yeah. <laughs> All right. Hey, I got to tell you, half my career, something worked, and I, I, I don't have time for the explanation. Right. I got to get that. I got to get 11 kids out on the field to play. I got to step in the discus ring. You know, we, I got to step on the platform. Don't, don't tell me. I don't want to wait till we find out how it works. You know, how does yoga make you more flexible? <laughs> Go to 30 classes, then let's talk. Right. That's something. Are you familiar? Do you know John Hines, Monkey Bar Gym? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So John learned a method of yoga called Aishans Yoga from a guy called Roger Aishans. And Roger uh, helped John like overcome uh, a debilitating limp from dunking the basketball too much. He had created such a dysfunction and imbalance in his legs. <laughs> And John asked, well, how does this work? And Roger said, what difference does it make? It worked. Right? Is, do you really need to know that it was your iliacus and your it's, glute it's maximus? Probably, yeah. In fact, it probably hurt you to know. You know? <laughs> right. How did it work? Well, there's no reason. It's voodoo. <laughs> yeah, right. So if we could distill all of this. Sure. Um, okay. So the average person, when it comes to health and fitness the average person just needs to do healthy things to remain healthy eat real food fasten your seatbelt, take care of your teeth don't visit smoke. the doctor don't smoke because that's related to health oh that's in fact if you did not smoke wear your seatbelt, see the doctor make sure you got because the thing is catch those things early you know, like I sent in one of my guys in 91. I don't know if you know about my stand in one foot test. Mm-hmm. He was one, okay, if you can't stand on your foot for 10 seconds, I send you to a doctor. In 1991, I sent this guy to the doctor. The doctor goes, I don't see anything wrong, gets the blood test back, and his PSA, uh, his prostate, mm-hmm. the numbers were high. Now, why he couldn't stand on one foot with the early signs of prostate cancer, I don't know. They were able to fix it as smoothly because it was caught so early, mm-hmm. right? he's still around doing fine. So, I mean, honestly, go see a doctor, get your teeth clean, uh, get your eye exam. It, here's the thing, because prevention in the world of health is, I mean, if you ever worked with somebody who's been in an auto or motorcycle accident, the amount of work it takes to undo mm-hmm. that, that kind of damage you know, versus not having an auto accident, you know? Yeah. So really in health and folks listening, it is that simple. And then when it comes to fit and, and that's the hard part is that it is simple and maybe we'll be there. <laughs> we can address that. 
uh, sometimes it's like too simple to believe. It can't be that simple, right? Yeah. It's like uh, if you eat less, you'll probably weigh less, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, and when it comes to fitness, the ability to do things. A task. If a task, the ability to do things, whatever it is, choose the right, choose the correct modality that's going to get the job done. So to quote Dan, the goal is to keep the goal the goal. So if your goal is to be a discus thrower, do the things that discus throwers do in order to be fit enough to throw a discus, correct? Well, in, in a sense, it's performance. You might have to do some things that might okay. actually beat you up a little bit long term. But that's not in the realm of health. That's in fitness. Fitness and performance. So try to mentally keep health and longevity on one. Okay. And then fitness and performance in another. Okay. And because they are, they are, they are different silos. <sighs> so if you want to be fit and perform, if you want to be fit and perform well, throwing a discus may not be the path for you. Doing a fitness, doing a, a, a discus workout, even though the discus thrower has incredible abs and legs, doesn't necessarily mean that's the path. No. You may be able to get away with ju just squats, push-ups, pull-ups, that kind of thing. Is that correct? You might be able to get away with goblet squats, some hinges and carrying a bag around the corner once or twice. Right. So, and that, that's, that's the part I, w I would, I wish we could um, like solve because it's, this is the thing that keeps me up at night. <laughs> you can ask, you can ask my wife. She, she's so patient with me because I, I try to think about what is it that gets people to, to do superfluous things if really all you have to do is carry something heavy, push yourself off the ground and uh, hinge, why go through the extra effort of... It's because it's not sexy. Is that it? Uh, and I got to tell you, I mean, almost every listener, wouldn't, you, if, wouldn't it be great to have that sit your 16-year-old 16, 16 self down and say, uh, listen, I know you've been told all these things. I'm telling you, you know, 50, 40 years later, I'm telling you, don't do the following thing. All that stuff mom said is all true. <laughs> you know, where, you know, and some of you will say, no, don't, you know, but it is, it is so simple. Uh, the easiest way to stay thin your whole life is to never get fat. And I, I say this in my new workshops and it's funny, I got some pushback when I was in Norway on this sentence, but it's not what you eat. It's what you ate. It's not what you eat. I don't want to hear about this great diet you're going on tomorrow. It's what you've been eating for the last 20 years ago, what you've been eating, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's your past. It's your past tense. That's killing you. Correct. You know? And uh, when you woke up this morning, you are the sum of all the decisions you've made your whole life. Having said that, you know, my family had a, we've had a, lost a, Uncles in World War II had a cousin killed in Korea. My brother's blown up in um, uh, Vietnam. It is true things happen. And I know we bump into people who have been in auto accidents and stuff or get terrible debilitating disease. God bless you. But for a lot of us, we are the sum of our choices. Mm -hmm. And boy, that's a tough thing to hear because you want to blame somebody else. Right. Right. Um, and it's the same thing you're talking about the shoulder. It's not what you did picking up your newspaper in the morning didn't blow your shoulder out. It's what you had done 475,000 times up to that point, right? One of the worst injuries in my career, I picked up a typewriter. <laughs> uh, for those young people, a typewriter is a device <laughs> that you put paper in and you type and words came up. It was about 20 pounds and I leaned over and Joan Dunn's desk cut my legs back. So I leaned over and I was in that perfect wrong position. And it was like a lightning bolt hit me. I mean, mm -hmm. seriously, I could feel a lightning bolt. I was sick to my stomach for mm. hours. And it cost me a year. I was, it was a year of pain. And people have asked me, well, you should have picked up the typewriter right. And I go, mm -hmm. okay. 
no, the body was strong. <laughs> it was all those years of not hinging. Even though I'm a lifter, right. you don't always hinge right. You do stupid stuff. You throw the discus. You throw the hammer. You, you, know, you do dumb stuff. You play football. But you're right. And it's a tough lesson. Um, and again, I don't, and, and listener, God bless you. I don't want you to think I'm being, um, uh, you know, either, 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 I'm just saying we all face this. Yeah. And one of the things is once you embrace that concept, it is funny how once you say, okay, I got here on this path, whew, this isn't the path I want to be on. And boy, that decision can change the game. Mm hmm. And I've done that a few times in my life, and I'm very proud of that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not, I mean, I don't know how well you know my, my life story, but it's not all been roses, man. Right. But there's been a few times in my life I've just stopped and said, this is not who I want to be. And yeah. man, when I got back from the Middle East, um, I was in a basement apartment, a fold-out bed, uh, not great stuff. And I said, I'm going to put myself on a reading program, and I did. And even though I had all those degrees and stuff, I, it just changed my life. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just, you know, it's, it's, it's the same thing I would tell everyone. It was a little bit every day over a long time, little and often over the long haul. Consistency. Right. Yeah. And it doesn't happen. And the thing is, man, it's what I always joke about. You know, it's not the first week of January, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Uh, 186 easy workouts are better than three hard workouts in January. Right. right. You just keep adding those up. It just, good things happen. You make, you make seven good food decisions a day, not to eat four of them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, over it, it's going to be any lotion, potion and pill you find at GNC. Right. It's like, um, when I spoke with Brett Jones, he talked about it like in the case of kind of like in finances, you just, you're saving, you keep just tucking away like consistently yeah. uh, with strength and good choices. And you just start to accrue a, a nice savings account or a nice bank from which to take these units when you need them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, and it gives you wiggle room when you're consistent uh, and you're getting it. Didn't Tim Ferriss come up with like, if you're, good 86 percent of the time did you did you That's, read his book the four hour body, the body. yeah it, it's it, it, he uses the Pareto's law 80 20 a lot yeah you know he has a cheat he has the one day a week cheat day and here's the funny thing most people once they dial it in it's like why am i still cheating right you know why am i eating all of a sudden eating all these um uh, why do i have to have all these candy bars on a day i don't right. i don't i have chosen not to eat them uh, yeah, he, he, you know, someone made fun of him. I, I, I don't, I don't, he's a, he's also a kettlebell guy. Mm -hmm. Someone made fun of him about how his training was stupid. It's like, I can't, I, I defended him. You know, he was born with a, a bad lung problem. Mm. In fact, I think one of his lungs doesn't even work very well. And I thought to myself, and I, so I posted on, uh, in fact, Chip Morton um, posted it. I said to Chip, I said, and I wrote right there on the thing, I said, you know, give the guy a break. He was born with a lung issue mm -hmm. and he has figured out a way to reroute his training. It's like when you're around, a, I don't know if you ever worked with disabled athletes from either war accidents or birth, you know, you'll be working with these guys and all of a sudden they have figured out a workaround mm -hmm. that I'm actually sitting there going, yeah, okay. What did you say? I'll do that one more time. Yeah. Right <laughs> right. You, so sometimes I actually embrace people who don't listen, I'm a big engine. I mean, I, this is going to sound really weird to say it's Brown, but I'm a lot bigger than people think I am. Right. Mm -hmm. It's weird to say that because everyone, when I've had people so often say, Oh, I thought you'd be bigger. And then we'll take a photo together. And I, <laughs> I just tower over this per, poor person, you know? And, uh, you know, uh, the world record holding the discus once said to me, he wish he had my fast twitch. Mm. So, I'm a fast twitch monster. I'm my brain is fast twitch. Everything that I do is like this, you know? <laughs> so, and here I am defending a guy with a bad lung because it's like, okay, I can do these things because I lucked out in the genetic roulette here and here and here. Mm -hmm. and, and it really bothers me. So yeah, I have, uh, uh, 
Tim will say some odd things, but I also respect him because he's, he has worked around an issue that a lot of us probably don't appreciate. Mm -hmm. And what, what he was saying about uh, being right 80% of the time, we'll just, we'll narrow it down to 80, 20, yeah, whatever. Yeah. So even, even if you want, it just gives you wiggle room to have those cheap meals. If you want them, it gives you wiggle room to, um, you know, uh, I don't want to say like blow out your disc, picking up your bedroom slip slippers, but you, it gives you wiggle room to make yeah. some mistakes. You recover quicker because most, most people have the model flipped 20% of the time they're eating. Okay. 20% of the time, maybe they're off the couch and just 80% of the time. Not so good. So they don't have as much wiggle room for I'm ask you a question. Yeah. I call it the prisoner's dilemma. And okay. I ask everybody I work with, you have a goal. Do you have a goal? Well, yeah, to keep muscle on my frame and keep my joints mobile. Okay, good. I like that. It's not bad. Okay, so for whatever reason, you're a political prisoner. You are only allowed three 15-minute 15 15 minute bouts a week to address your goal. Yeah. But what? Three. 15 minutes. It's funny. I've asked a very famous division. In fact, there's a chance that the team might win the national championship again. <laughs> I've asked this for dozens of people. And if you take it seriously, mm -hmm. so for example, I'm a discus thrower. I would do this. I would get a ball with a handle and I would do full turns into a wall. I'd have a, a barbell right there. I do some uh, overhead squats. I do more full turns. I might do some kettlebell swings. So if you ever see me training as a discus thrower, you don't see me doing full turns, right? Yeah. overhead squats and swings, right. you just walk over and say, what are you doing on it? Because how you answer the prisoner's dilemma will tell you the 80%. Gotcha. That's excellent. So That's one excellent. thought I would have for you, for this is your homework assignment, Brian, for this test, uh, for this uh, podcast. Why don't you write down your, your answer to the, uh, you know, take a day or two or whatever. Mm -hmm. What are the, how would you spend that 15 minutes? I, d I guarantee it won't be running on a treadmill. No, no, <laughs> no. You know, and it's funny at this, and I'm, I'm going to take you up on that. And I've, pr I've probably got a pretty good idea of it anyhow. Because, yeah, of course you. Well, let's hear it. Well, it's because I, how I, it's how I train is, um, so three 15 minute sessions a week. Was yeah, it? That's it. Well, then it would have to be some kind of strength training. So uh, assuming the prison has no equipment. Oh, we can't have anything. I'll ship anything. For you, you ship any, anything. But you only have the, it's the time. Yeah. Understood. Understood. So I would, uh, I would probably do strength training, something or other. And I can get into details when I think a little deeper about it. Joint mobility, something or other. And then more strength training, something or other, so that I could keep up my strength and my mobility, because that's what I'm trying to do. How about during your rest periods after your lift, you do mobility? Yeah. Welcome to the, how I came up with the way I teach people how to train now. Yeah, exactly. We never have rest periods. We have no rest periods. Right. Our so rest periods are bird dogs, uh, original strength work from Tim Anderson, yeah. yoga like positions, next set of squats. Uh, neck nods it there is no rest period got you because what you just it's funny you just said that because you just got you were just inside my head how was it <laughs> it was great yeah. there's a lot to choose from <laughs> what you're saying is exactly right so when you when you do the prisoner's dilemma i find it free now i asked josh hillis about this with fat loss and he said prep and cook food yeah, food journal. Some, it had to be a food journal in there somewhere. I was just saying, it said prep and cook food. Yeah. Because to him, fat loss happens in the kitchen. Right. And if you, if you followed up and said, well, don't you see some body comp work? Uh, chop vegetables, do a pull-up. Chop vegetables, do a pull-up. Chop chicken, do a pull-up. Right. But, but the truth is, you know, once you think this through, this, the magic happens. Man. Yeah. I know that you had, you had blogged about you're at the age now where you're more likely to survive cancer than a slip and fall. Is that correct? I, from personal experience. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So at my age, 
the most dangerous thing in my home is the floor. So I was going down the stairs a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I just got over a total hip. And my dog, serious Black, <laughs> you know how you used to do in the school year, you'd knock someone's knee out and they would oh, fall. Yeah. Yeah. He, took, he took my leg out and I hit and I hit the banister here on my ribs real hard, which I, I've been suffering from pleurisy since 1957. So anytime I get a rib injury, basically that's why I'm coughing. I get pleurisy Yeah, and it hit the ground hard too. And I gathered up and I called Tiff and I said, I have never been so afraid in my life. I was mm. here. I'm 61. If a fight breaks out, you want me on your side. And all, all that stuff I tell people in my workshops was, was me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, at my age in America, a uh, cancer diagnosis and a, a, a fall where you break something, your two-year survival rate is higher if you get cancer. So it's real. It's real. And so part of a balanced training program. Up and down, up and up down. Up and down. Just get up. And, I know you have, you have a... A get up, get down. Is that correct? Oh, you? Yeah. So we'll include that in the notes, how to do a proper get up, get down. Is that and really, point? folks, all I'm going to do is say, get on your belly, get back up. Get on your left side, get back up. Get on your right side, get back up. Push up position plank, get back up. On your back, get back up. Okay, that's round one. Left hand is stuck to your left knee. Get on your belly, get back But it's that simple. But if you do, I mean, we have, I, I took a group of special forces guys to the edge about a couple of weeks ago. I made him do five of that in 10 different, po you know, here's a posture, hands in your butt cheeks is a posture uh, in groups. Um, and these guys were saying, I can't believe how tired I got. Yeah. So it's, it's simple, but it's very effective. <laughs> no, that's true. Yeah, Brian, that's a big one. That's a big yeah. one. Yeah. That's what we try to share at, at our studio too, is we, we try to explain to folks that, a hidden benefit of yoga, just even across the board, it doesn't really have to do with like the mythology of yoga. It doesn't have to do with the yogic texts or Patanjali. It just has to do with standing for a while, getting to the ground, standing back up and getting back down on the ground again. So pretty much any yoga method that you're trying where you get up and down off the ground a couple of times, you're going to benefit from. I have a video I'll send you. Oh, great. And ideally, I'll send you something else, okay? Perfect. Great. And we'll, we'll put that, I'll put that in the, uh, the description on the YouTube channel and uh, in okay. the blog. I'll provide a link. That'll be great. Yeah. Awesome. Is there anything else you'd like to add as we wrap this up? Anything that we may have missed or anything that you want to summarize? Well, yeah. You know, if you don't mind, um, you know, it bothers me when people think that uh, like weightlifting and yoga, weightlifting nutrition, uh, weightlifting meditation, meditation and recovery, recovery. And, and, and people try to go, they're all these separate things. Uh, there's a guy named Steve Ilg, who I think does a real good job with holistic fitness. He's, he combines the strength training with the yoga, with the cardio. And I think what big kids in our industry need to start doing, folks, is realizing that a good yoga practice is a should lend itself to an intelligent approach to nutrition, recovery, sleep, meditation, reading good books, being a nice neighbor, picking up your dog's poop, uh, <laughs> chat where it should be. There should the one of the things I get very concerned about in in my lifetime is this fracture. I think the national discord we have right now is is a great example of how bad. I mean, of what happens. Um, I guess the only thing we did mention, I have a new book coming out. I'm not folks. I'm not pimping it out to you at all, but it is the reason I think this book is special is that it starts off with what I call my 10 commandments of coaching, which are, you know, constant, <laughs> yes, you know, constantly upgrade mm -hmm. that very simple stuff, you know, but number 10 is always take a moment to respect your mentors. And then the whole, the biggest part of the book, is my life story as an athlete, but it's not. It's what my it's my mentors, what they taught me, uh, their the sacrifices they made for me to put me where I am today. There's some tough stuff that I talk about. Some tough stuff in there, and the last part of the book is 
you, some of you might not want to read it, or it's, it, but it's how I now break down coaching. Uh, I break it down into you know, number one is uh, there's, there's there's two parts. One is the big picture of things, and of course the first chapter of that is the big picture. <laughs> the big picture, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, most of my great athletes never n- made a nickel professionally, but you know, my doctor is a former athlete of mine. My lawyer is a former athlete. My mortician is a former athlete of mine. And I got professors, uh, former athletes of mine, professors of English, of law, of art, of just a dozen. Uh, one of my former athletes is a videographer living in London now. He did that. And to me, when as a coach, I'm always looking at, you know, 20 years from now when they're, you know, making a, I want to make sure the lessons they learn from me as a coach. So that to me is the big picture. And then I break down how I coach uh, elite athletes mostly. I don't, and then uh, on a little bit on nutrition. Um, <laughs> nutrition's a tough one. <laughs> exercise has no value in fat loss. But if you don't exercise, all these terrible things happen to you. So one of the problems people have to learn is that Exercise is probably one of the greatest pills you can take for your health, fitness, longevity, and performance. Exercise really doesn't have a lot of value in fat loss, maybe 5%. But that's all people want to do is talk about fat loss. Right. So, but I have to defend exercise for all the other things in life. Right. And see how people compartmentalize mentally? I want to lose fat. Yeah. For what? I want to look good in a bikini. Well, do you want to dance your granddaughter's wedding? Because to me, that's the first right place my brain goes will i be able to dance at josephine's wedding my granddaughter you know first place my brain goes (laughs) that's awesome yes so the book is kind of in three parts um but you don't have to buy it uh you have i'm going to step in here i'm going to intervene you do have to buy it because dan's work is great it's um it's captivating it's it's interesting and it's applicable across everything it's it's principle based stuff earlier in our conversation dan was saying like the things he learns in the gym and applies it to life it's comparable to anything really like you learn stuff in the yoga studio about yourself you learn to be more compassionate and more patient with yourself and hopefully you become more compassionate and more patient with others and i'm sure it's comparable to like when you're trying to learn a technical lift like the yeah. snatch or how to throw a discus is I'm sure it's extreme. It's easy, but extremely technical too. And you've got to be patient and hopefully it spreads to everyone around you. Right. I tell this story a lot, Brian, you mentioned lifting. So when I first learned to Olympic lift, that was pretty good. Within the first year I snatched the first nine months after I learned Olympic lift, I snatched 231 pounds. Okay. That's good. Very good. Well, my personal record is 314 pounds. That happened 17 years later. People miss that little line. Yeah, there's like, (laughs) right? They just see the 314. They miss the 17 years. They don't see the 2,427 other lifts that led up to it, right? And like like I retired, basically I retired at 52. And people said, what'd you do? And I said, well, I had this brilliant policy of I would save 10% of everything I earned and remain as debt-free as I possibly could. Oh, so what's the secret? Yeah, that's the secret. Yeah, no one's ever. (laughs) Yeah. I just came, I made that up. I made up this idea of saving money and being relatively debt-free. Yeah. Live below your means. How how do you have a good marriage? I mean, you know, I mean, it's not a lot of secrets in life. You know, everybody, everyone loves the conspiracy theories and stuff, you know, that the Vatican combined with the Deutsche Bank combined with the, you know, that guy does the movie where the national treasure is hidden the thing. Oh, <laughs> yeah. No, it's true. Right. And it's not UFOs and it's not, you know, it's just life is pretty simple. And that's the biggest problem most people face. Yeah. And as in training as it is with life training, it's pretty simple. Exercising, nutrition, it's all simple. We just have to do it. Yeah, just have to do it. It's like uh, show up, right? Punch the clock type stuff. There you go. You should write a book about that. (laughs) 
you've already written the books. You've saved me the time. Thank there you. There you go. There you go. Well, awesome. thank you, Brian. This was great. Thank you, Dan. And um, thank you, everyone. I'll put I'll all that email stuff to you. I'm sorry? Email to you in about a minute, okay? Okay. And once I get that email from Dan, I'll put it in the uh, description boxes below. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. You bet. Talk to you soon, okay? Okay.